Here we are. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm Norman Perlstein, Executive Editor of the Los Angeles Times, and I'm very happy to be the moderator for this closing uh, plenary session on developing unity, inspiration, and creativity. And um, I'm going to ask that our panelists each begin with some prepared remarks, which would be then followed by a conversation um, among us. So um, I would like to ask uh, Minister Oquist uh, if you would begin uh, speaking more generally to the topic and then specifically about implications for, for Nicaragua. So thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much for the kind invitation to such a prestigious forum. If we look at this at the world level, the world is now facing the combined consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, the long lockdowns, the Great Depression 2020, accelerating extreme inequality, and the initiation of the Second Cold War. During the Great Depression that began in 1929, U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt famously pronounced, all we have to fear is fear itself. In 2020, Fear has gone viral, <clears throat> and confidence in the future has turned to despair. Recovery will require reestablishing confidence and hope in the future. If we all are just contemplating a decade, and that following this decade of 2020 onwards, renewed outbreaks of COVID-19, re-lockdowns, falling GDPs, accelerating inequality and um, in, increased tensions in the international sphere during to, due to a second cold war and massive unemployment, the depression will become both economic and of the collective psyche. In such an abyss, consumers will spend very little, investors will invest very little, and the economy will recover very slowly. One way to restore confidence and hope for the future would be to establish the International Panel on Climate Change's goals as official international policy for how to limit climate change to 1.5 degrees in this, uh, in this century. In a book I published this year called Equilibra, the... Uh, philosophy and political economy of existence and extinction, I say the following about this. The novel coronavirus and COVID-19 demonstrate <clears throat> how unprepared we are to confront our high-risk threats and how little we invest politically and economically in avoiding them, which also applies to the threats of nuclear weapons and climate change. The degree of disruption of our lives, societies, and economies of the novel coronavirus and the disease COVID-19 is greater than 9-11, the 2007-2009 financial crisis, and the subsequent Great Recession combined. Yet the disruption of the coronavirus is small, transient, and recoverable compared to the total permanent and irreversible damage of a nuclear exchange or the disruption of the ecosystems and synergies between them that maintain life on planet Earth, including the critical variable temperature. The Glasgow COP26 climate summit could be the opportunity for the nations of the world to declare that it's international policy to achieve a sustainable circular net zero emission society by 2050 and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by minus 40%, 45% by 2030 in order to position ourselves for the 2050 objective. The UK and Italy that are the sponsors of this would need the commitment of the 10 countries which are the highest emitters, either at the national or subnational levels. They account for 72% of all emissions, while the 100 countries with least emissions only account for 3%. This would inspire confidence in the future because it would allow us to avoid the worst consequences of climate change. It would also allow 
for climate change not to fall off the COVID, post-COVID-19 agenda. And uh, this is very important because the zero emission society must be the first priority for recovery. If not, it will not sail and it will sink in a sea of competing priorities because there's too many priorities on the agenda right now. So we must make sure that the zero emission society is the top priority so that climate change does not wither as a policy objective and we can inspire confidence in the future and hope as part of the recovery process. In Nicaragua, the recovery is doesn't require an abrupt transition. This is because Nicaragua had no lockdown. The second poorest country in Latin America and the Caribbean has been trying to learn how to live and combat COVID-19 and function as a society and economy at the same time. Nicaragua and Sweden are examples of two countries that have been with this strategy from the beginning. In the case of Nicaragua, the logic is that 40% of the population is in the countryside living in the subsistence economy. And the people living in that economy have to get out of the house every day to get water, to get firewood, to be able to cook, to milk the cow, to gather the eggs, to go to town to sell their small accidents on the local market. Also, 80% of the urban workers are in the informal sector and earn their daily bread uh, daily. They do not work, they cannot put food on the family table. Also, in terms of education in Nicaragua, the private schools opted to close and resort to virtual online courses. However, public schools remained open because poor families lacked the uh, IT equipment or the conditions in their homes to allow for an online education. Therefore, so that the, the poor do not fall behind, that the poor urban worker, the poor subsistence farmer, and the poor students are not prejudiced by the response to coronavirus and COVID-19. We are, have been learning how to move ahead like this. However, as societies are coming out of their lockdowns, almost all societies are learning how to do this these days. Italy is learning now quite successfully how to do this, how to live and combat COVID-19 at the same time as our economies and societies function. And that in of itself, I think, is uh, something that inspires hope and uh, confidence in the future on the part of our, of our citizenry. The magic bullets of a, of a remedy or the magic bullet of a, of a vaccination would be great, but we can't count on that. How many years have passed since HIV uh, came on the scene and there's no vaccination for HIV as yet? So we must also prepare for the worst uh, case scenario while we hope for the best at the same time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Paul. And we'll certainly come back to some of those points that you raised um, um, in, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but now I would ask that uh, Mayor Nasser from uh, uh, representing the United Nations uh, please follow up uh, with the perspective for us. So thank you again for joining us. Thank, thank you, Norman. And I think the session and the topic are timely for happening in the year that the UN is marking 75 years of existence. When you talk about developing unity, inspiration, and creativity, the creation of the United Nations itself in 1945 was uh, in response to the aspirations of the generations that have went through two world wars to unite, to find a way to agree together on, on common solutions that get humanity to a better place. Now, in his speech to the General Assembly in January of this year, at the beginning of the year, Secretary General Antonio Guterres outlined that four horsemen are at the moment threatening the world and, and creating rising challenges that need to be addressed at the same time. And those were the highest global geopolitical tensions that have continued to rise, climate crisis, uh, the deep and growing global mistrust, and of course, 
The fourth was the dark side of innovation. Last week on the 22nd of September, when he spoke to the General Assembly again, and this is the first time in the organization's history that we actually had a virtual UN General Assembly. World leaders were not present in New York as they they have been for the last 74 sessions of the GA. They sent recorded statements. Uh, he added the fifth horseman, which is the COVID crisis and the impact it has had. From the beginning, it was very clear from the United Nations leadership uh, point of view, uh, as, as stated by Tech General Tony Guterres, and of course with the leadership of WHO on the health side, World Health Organization, that this crisis had three dimensions that, that necessitate, if anything else, working together, the need for unity and coordination at a time of a pandemic are paramount. Uh, first, it is it is indeed a, a large health crisis that requires coordination because viruses know no borders. The minute you can contain it in one place, people travel today, we live in a global village, it will come back and we have seen this time and again. Certain countries reach zero local transmission for weeks and even months on end and then somebody traveling, coming back, and it started in one place, and now we have it globally. So coordination on the health side, following the science and the advice of WHO is critical to basically prevention, uh, the co coordinated work to create a vaccine. Uh, His Excellency spoke about a vaccine. Yesterday there was an event at the UN uh, with the leadership of the Secretary General, WHO, and member states that aimed to raise $35 billion for what, what we are calling the ACT Accelerator, accelerating finding solutions to deal and tackle with COVID, not only in terms of vaccine, but also treatments, but also prevention and, and uh, supporting the communities affected. The second side of this crisis, which also reflects and, and, and necessitates cooperation and solidarity, is the social economic impact that it has had on populations around the world and and no country was spared. Even countries around the world that had very few numbers of cases, the absence and, and, and fail amid basically the impact on tourism, which in, mo in, in most cases for those countries, a uh, major source of income uh, or export of certain commodities have been affected, the slowdown of the, of the economies. For the first time since the 1990s, we're witnessing a global rise in poverty. For the first time, we are seeing rising numbers of people who are hungry and, and food insecurity. These are warnings that have been voiced by the executive director of World Food Program, by the UN Emergency Coordinator, Mark Lowcock, uh, at a meeting on COVID uh, financing. And, and all of that is necessitating more solidarity, more coordination, more unity between nations because no country is safe if another country is, un is still having the virus in, 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 that, in, in, it, in itself. The third element that the UN is looking at that is necessary for our global effort to deal with the crisis is using the recovery as a way to address uh, the climate crisis, to address economic uh, environmental degradation, the loss of biodiversity, and using the public funds that will be necess necessary to use to reanimate the economies should not be invested in the same old way in fossil fuels. They could be invested in a ways that address the climate crisis, inequalities, exclusion, the gaps in social protection systems, and many other injustices. But COVID has worked like an x-ray. It has exposed the inequalities in societies, whether they are social inequalities, racial inequalities, to the extent that we have an opportunity to use the recovery to address these inequalities, the climate crisis, in a way that helps us reach the global goals in 2030, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. So with all of that, the theme of this session of developing unity, inspiration, and creativity are exactly timely and offer us the formula for finding a way out of this crisis. Creativity will help us find the vaccine. Creativity will help us find ways to create the economies back on track in a way that addresses uh, the climate and uh, crisis and, and others. So this is a timely moment. And I think coming just a week or within the last week of the 
opening debate of the General Assembly, many of the speeches that uh, we heard, and, and we heard virtually this time, uh, not in person in the hall, but still, world leaders uh, reaffirmed their belief in working together in multilateralism. The theme of the 75th anniversary of the United Nations was uh, the United Nations we want, the future we need, and reaffirming our collective commitment to multilateralism. So I think what people of the world need to do now is hold their leaders to what they have themselves said they would do, work together to come over and, and get over these crises. And I will stop here. Okay, well, well, thank you very much. Maybe one very quick follow-up. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how the, um, how the General Assembly worked in a virtual world? Is it something that people said, I'll never do that again, or um, think of the savings in, uh, in expense and logistical effort uh, from not having to have everyone come every year to New York in September? I I'm curious uh, what the mood was during and after the event. I think, I mean, having worked in New York for nine years and, and, and being present in nine previous uh, or eight, and this would have been my ninth, you miss the buzz. And the General Assembly is not just about coming to New York to deliver a statement. There are hundreds of bilateral meetings, if not thousands of bilateral meetings that take place, signing of agreements, signing of uh, conventions, and, and of course, uh, side events that are focused on key issues that member states' leadership and the UN and other funds and programs put on the agenda. That was absent. But there was a lot of discussion among member states about the best format to replace the actual physical presence. But I think everybody was guided with the need to avoid violating our own advice on large gatherings and the way to social distancing. So the proposal to, for world leaders to send recorded statements was accepted. Uh, by the President General Assembly was negotiated and accepted by member states. The webcast and the technology luckily worked. I have been working from home for six months. Uh, <laughs> it's very strange if you have told me a year ago that I would be working from home for six months. And I don't know, maybe another three months, maybe less, maybe more. Who knows? Uh, I, I would not have thought it possible. But we, I think the purpose of the UNGA was fulfilled. Of course, the bilateral meetings, the other side events did not take place as usual. If this is going to be the norm, I doubt it. But also we had, for the first time, the highest number of heads of government and state delivered statements. Because many heads of government and state usually do not, they do not all come. I mean, maybe 70, 80, 90 come. But this, this time we had more than 120 who participated because they did not need to travel. And as you said, I think the... Uh, this would have probably been the lowest carbon uh, emission friendly onga. Right. Um, Paul, I'd like to pick up on a, a couple things that you were discussing. One was that you, if I read correctly, the sort of existential crisis that you point to would be climate change and nuclear um, proliferation, if you will. Um, would you also say that um, income inequality or uh, and um, and and the ways in which nations uh, interact with each other also cause concerns for you, although perhaps somewhat less? Uh, I'd be curious, uh, just from from your perspective, um, as to. Um, how much danger is associated with, especially COVID seems to have very much focused on inequalities of all kinds in terms of who, who at least in, in the U.S., who is most likely to be affected by it and so forth. And I'd, I'd be curious about um, the ways in which you might either see a bilateral or multilateral world reacting to these things. It's not less at all. It is one of the most major problems the world confronts. Even prior to COVID-19, the IMF, the World Bank, the Regional Economic Commissions of the United Nations have been calling for attention to growing inequality that is a threat 
to the world economy. Let's look at this a little bit historically. After the Great Depression, of the Long Depression of the 19th century that ended in 1890, there was a major redistribution in the form of the Sherman Antitrust Act in the United States, which was then followed by several other countries. And here there was a confrontation of Rockefeller's oil, Carnegie Steel, and Harriman's railway monopolies, the most powerful interests in the country. After the 1907 financial crisis, the inequality was addressed in a, in a, in a period of time through the 13th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States that constituted the federal income tax, progressive income tax, major redistribution. In the Great Depression that began in 1929, the redistributive mechanisms were multiple, but the most significant was the institution of Social Security with a payroll tax to be paid by both employers and employees, big time redistribution. After the financial crisis of, of 2007, 2009, when, the, when there have been all these calls by the international organizations about inequality, nothing happened with regard to inequality. Dodd-Frank and Basel III, the two major responses, had to deal with the systemic risk of taxpayers bailing out banks, not the inequality that was being produced in those situations. Coming into COVID-19, inequality was hence one of the major uh, driving forces, negative driving forces in the economy with great political implications also. And what happens with uh, COVID-19? Well, I can illustrate it with Jeff Bezos of uh, Amazon making $43 billion in four months and then $14 billion in one month in the same period that 50 million U.S. workers filed for unemployment insurance for the, for the first time. No, the world needs to come to terms with growing inequality. And I would say that this is very much linked to the resources needed to confront COVID-19 and for the resources needed to uh, finance the recovery. Because these resources exist but they're badly allocated. They're not allocated according to the, the priorities that we need to meet our, our, our objectives like the Sustainable Development Goals, like confronting uh, climate change, like dealing with uh, this pandemic and, and, and future pandemics. And I would like to address uh, the question of the resources and how they can be a source of inspiring unity, inspiration, and creativity by using a little financial creativity too. But I'll save that for uh, another intervention. Okay. So we'll cut it off and, and leave it at, at inequality for now. Uh, Mayor, could you come back specific? I'd like to get a sense of where you think um, the UN can be effective in dealing with COVID. Uh, is it um, is it through WHO that you would see the most opportunity? Is it um, is it something where you would contemplate um, conferences specifically dedicated to COVID that you would be sponsoring? Uh, how do you uh, and if so, how do you? deal with some of the decoupling type issues we've seen as, you know, for example, between U.S. and China and just even affixing blame, let alone trying to come up with solutions. And I'm, I'm curious from your perspective as to what, where you think you can play an active role and where you may just have to be on the sidelines uh, watching um, some of these big emitters who have other attributes as well, sort of fighting it out among themselves. No, I mean, I think, I mean, from from what I have seen and based on, of course, the role that the Secretary General has himself uh, taken since the crisis started. On the health side, he recognized WHO as a technical organization within the UN with the expertise to, to direct and advise on what is necessary and, and how to tackle this. 
WHO also is, is working very closely with Gavi, uh, SEPI, and others, uh, the Gates Foundation, not just with governments, but also with private foundations and institutions to accelerate the tools that will help us defeat COVID. And those are not just the vaccine, uh, the treatments, but also the, su the support network around it. The, the meeting that I mentioned yesterday was uh, was an example. Uh, about $1 billion, or so over $1 billion were pledged uh, to help the ACT Accelerator uh, Initiative. That is something that focusing on one side of it. The WHO and the UN do not work in isolation. We have to work with member states, but at this stage, we recognize that there are many stakeholders beyond member states that need to be at the table, need to be involved in finding the way forward for us to, to arrive at a solution. From the beginning, also, the Secretary General in the UN system has been producing policy briefs that focus on specific uh, areas of how COVID has impacted, for example, the situation of certain develop developing countries most needy, the uh, most vulnerable, refugees and migration, women. Uh, there was a there was a call for ceasefire by the Secretary General at, in March, which he reiterated again last week, that at a time when humanity is facing one common enemy, uh, a microscopical virus that has brought the world economy to its feet, down on its feet, uh, requires us to put more weapons down and let's walk. And he spoke about the need to reduce the geopolitical tension and working together. Uh, that is that is something that has he has repeated time and again. And the WHO has warned from the beginning from the politicization of the virus. I mean, it's, it's an issue that is very important that this is, this is a zoonotic disease and it's not the first time that leads to a, a crisis that we need to confront and it will not be the last one because what humanity has been doing, we have been growing at the expense of the environment, we have been destroying forests, we have been living and going more in proximity where anim wild animals live, viruses are going to, more opportunities for viruses to jump, make that jump to cause additional uh, diseases such as this one uh, in the future. So it's very important that we learn the lessons from this and we, we protect the environment and we create better health systems to cope and to isolate these crises from the very beginning. Maybe just one, one point, just to build on what His Excellency spoke about rising inequalities. I mean, when, and that's something again, that, that needs to be addressed because when we talk about a vaccine, there's a race to get to the vaccine. Uh, there are 30 companies working on it. And I think there's a big danger of vaccine nationalization or nationalism. Um, I want the vaccine for my nation first, because as I said before, the virus knows no borders. We have to make sure that when a vaccine is found, the vaccine is made available to every country, to every person in different societies, because we have to protect everybody if we are to protect anybody. The rising inequalities on the economic, uh, again, the issue of resources, the, the richest 26 people on the planet their wealth is equivalent to half of the, the world's population. That is unimaginable. Uh, that is crazy to be to be blunt. And and the resources that can be and, and need to be utilized need to be brought to the table to help us <coughs> address those challenges. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, uh, Minister Warfi, uh, I think you're just joining us now. Um, happy to have you with us. Uh, are you able to hear us okay? Um, I'm just uh, uh, asking if uh, Minister, well, it looks like I may have just lost him for a second. So let's see whether if he comes back, I will ask him to give us some of his remarks. In the meantime, Paul, I just wanted to make sure you saw that uh, I've got my copy oh my here. <laughs> and, um, you made my day. Yes, well, it's, a, it's really a terrific book. Um, I think one of the things that I wanted to ask about from it was as you um, look at the issues of both nuclear uh, proliferation and climate change, um, 
there are those who say that if you are trying to balance economic recovery and growth um, with uh, some of these other issues that, um, in fact, we can't afford to um, ad address environmental change the way that you suggest because uh, it's just too expensive. Um, I think what I, I hear from you, in, at least in your book, is that if you attach the true costs of pollution, um, then uh, actually the argument for um, for working against climate change becomes much more obvious. Very much so, sir. I think that the, there's the good news and the bad news. The good news is that the resources exist to achieve our priorities. The bad news is that they're horribly allocated with regard to those priorities. There are some self-executing, fast, immediate, fast-track solutions. And there are a couple of things that would require action by the United Nations and national parliaments that would be very significant. With regard to these self-executing proposals, one would be to suspend all payments of foreign debt for developing countries without applying interest for the period 2020 to 2021. There are proposals already for, for 2024, I mean. There are proposals for 2021, but that's not long enough. We're just getting started in this. It is better for everyone that there is a suspension of payments of foreign debt as part of the solution instead of defaults of country after country as part of the problem, which would make the crisis worse. A second self-executing financial mechanism is that the European Union, the United States, Great Britain, Canada, and Switzerland are countries that apply illegal international coercive measures. The only legal sanctions are those of the United Nations Security Council. These measures affect 39 countries with more than 2 billion inhabitants. And according to Clause 7, Paragraph 1, Literal K, of the Rome Statute, applying these illegal measures in times of pandemic raises their illegality to the level of crime against humanity, <clears throat> given the weakening of health systems in times of pandemic. There are also those that are not self-executing that require some actions but that are very promising. Last year, Norm, the world's, and according to CIPRI, of the Swedish Peace Institute, the world spent $1.9 trillion on military expenditures. That is the highest expenditure since the first Cold War, and it was the highest increase from year to year in a decade. We really don't need that. We really don't need that. If only 20% of this military spending were to be reduced, that would free up $380 billion per year to convert COVID-19, the Great Depression 2020, accelerating extreme inequality and other priorities like achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. With regard to um, another issue, since 2009, the international community promised the developing developed countries $100 billion a year for climate change to the, um, to the developing countries. And this was the beginning of the year 2020. And now we're in the year 2020, and there's no sign of a working group or a or a, even a road map to how to get to those funds. Worried about this, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres invited French President Emmanuel Macron and Jamaican Prime Minister Andrew Holness to look for this $100 billion a year. The problem is that the appetite of developed country treasuries has already been tested, and it amounts to less than $15 billion for 2018-2023, based on the Green Climate Fund and Global Environmental Facility Replenishment. The solution is equity financing that could come from uh, institutional investors in the private sector to produce, and here I quote what the developing countries want, 
new additional predictable financing that is equally accessible and allocated according to developing country priorities. This could be achieved through International Renewable Energy Investment Fund, International Energy Efficiency Fund, and International uh, Forestry Investment Fund. Now, how to achieve that? Well, quite fortunately, the UK delegation includes Mr. Mark Carney, ex-governor of both the Bank of England and the Bank of Canada, with a 13-year stint in Goldman Sachs, who is eminently qualified to lead this resource mobilization effort, and coming out of a league in which $100 billion a deal is not such a big deal like it is to bureaucrats trying to pull it out of national treasuries. As a matter of fact, I was very pleased to see yesterday in the United States uh, session on the 2030, uh, how to finance the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, that uh, Mr. Mark Carney himself stated that we can go from the billions to trillions, tapping into institutional investor uh, financing, the uh, pension funds, the insurance investment funds, there's a marriage to be made in heaven, to be consummated between the insurance investment funds and uh, and climate finance. Right. They um, for, in, 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 in profit, profitable projects that increase the risk on the insurance side. So this is another promising line of how to finance our priorities as part of building back better and putting climate change and putting our other priorities, the sustainable development goals, up front in the rebuilding process. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, I see that uh, Minister Warfa is back uh, with us. Are you able to, to hear us okay? Yes, I, uh, you hear me, Norm? Yes, I can, and I would be grateful if uh, perhaps you could speak to our, our subject. Uh, we've, we've heard from... Um, from Mayor Nasser and from Paul Okus. So I would be grateful if you could tell us uh, from your perspective, um, what are the significant issues that we need to be focused on? Uh, please go ahead um, if you can hear us. Um, are you able to speak? Uh, Um, no, I'm afraid that uh, it, there yes. will be um, uh, some internet problem because we're not able to hear you. Well, I'm afraid we're... <laughs> I, I wish this was one of the skills I brought with me to this panel, but... Um, it seems that we have lost uh, him again. Um, I wanted to, uh, if, if we could um, move on to just one subject both of you have, have um, talked a little bit about, and that is the, the questions of bilateralism and multilateralism as we try to approach these existential problems. It seems that, if anything, over these last couple of years, especially given the leadership in the United States, the preference for bilateral discussion seems to have been front and center. Um, does it make it easier or harder for us to address these issues as a consequence? And, uh, Mayor, perhaps you could begin with that. It certainly does not make it easier. Uh, I mean, I think, if anything, it makes it much more difficult. The Secretary General, at, earlier this year, he spoke about at a time when we need uh, an alignment between power and leadership, we see where there is leadership, there is no power. And where there is power, there is no leadership. And he was talking about the context of COVID-19 and the fact that I've been the, within the United Nations, the Security Council is, is, of course, the only part of the organization that has the authority to take res adopt resolutions which can be implemented or enforced. Uh, the, there was no leadership on the issue of COVID. 
where yeah. WHO was providing the leadership and the advice, the WHO has no authority to impose its will on the member states. They cannot even force a country to to receive them. It's 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 a technical organization. So so that's that's in the context of multilateralism. It's important that we come together and agree to work together. Bilateralism is important because it is, of course, and there will always be bilateral arrangements uh, and bilateral tensions. But at the end of the day, when we are all facing a common threat, we need to come together and face it together. Uh, I think that's, that's the context. I see, Minister Warfare, that you're back. Let's let's. We just have a few more minutes before our session ends, so I'm going to just turn the. Uh, Microphone over to you if, if you're able to speak for a few minutes. Thank you. Oh, we lost him. Just lost him. Um, well, I I think we've... Um, ah, he's back. Okay, let's try again, please. Um, I see you. Uh, please go ahead. Well, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm really sorry about the, the network issue, Norm. And uh, in, in Somalia, I hope that you can hear me. I'm very happy to join the distinguished panelists. You can already see uh, the gap between uh, and, uh, and how difficult we have in the connections. Uh, but I wanted to thank you for us. Uh, if I ask, answer your questions uh, in Somalia, uh, on the 16th of March, 2020, Somalia recorded its first case of coronavirus. Um, I think it will have so, uh, to be another. Somalia comes to the top of the information global risk index with the vulnerability. I want to apologize. I think it was going to be. Uh, I'm going to be dis- disrupted uh, when I'm speaking. Yeah, I'm afraid. I'm afraid so. Uh, but we will. Uh, and I want, since we've only got. Let me say, Norm. Let me say, Norm. I'm very grateful about the opportunity, uh, at least, to be a part of this uh, global discussion. I was listening. I think I can hear you very well, but there is a weak connection. Uh, I don't know. If, right. you know well, I will, if you, if it, with having, your permission, I will attach the remarks that you had sent me ahead of time to any summary that we uh, put together. Um, so yes, I hope yes, you stay yes, healthy yes. and safe. And uh, again, thank you for joining us. And my thanks to um, to Paul and Mary as well for your comments. Um, and uh, I hope we get a chance to get this virus behind us so that we can have a conversation in person next time. So thank you very much for uh, participating today and so long. Thank, thank you so very much. much. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks for the kind invitation. Okay, thank you. And again, thank congratulations you. on your book. Thank you.